All right, come on, give Jesus a big hand clap. Come on. Come on, 11 o'clock, give Jesus a big hand clap in this place. Isn't God good? I love your church. I love uh, Pastor Luke and Pastor Angel are some of the greatest people on the planet. Um, aren't they? Can you just give your pastors just a tell them how much you love them? Become such great friends. Me and your pastor whooped up on all the other pastors this week at, a, at the Dream Conference golf tournament. Just, just beat them like a drum. I mean, it was, if it wasn't for the Dream Conference beforehand that lifted them up, we would have demoralized them the rest of the golf tournament. But it was incredible. Beat Brad. Brad didn't have a chance. And, uh, or Pastor Tommy didn't even have a chance. There was just no even, not even a chance. Sorry, Pastor, but, you know, it's just humble, just humble. Brings humility to the heart. Humility. Give it up for Pastor Bishop Tommy Barnett. The bishop. I love him so much, man. If I could be half the man that he is at 81, 81, 86, 81, 91. All right, looking good. <laughs> And we also want to welcome all of our live streamers. Dream City, can we welcome all of our live streamers that are watching online? We love you guys. Thank you so much. And I, I tell you, anytime you're in Phoenix, make sure you just come and uh, they will roll out the red carpet for you and bless you and make you feel you're, you're at home. This is a phenomenal church. If you're a guest here today, um, you need to come back because I'm not the pastor. You need to come here, Pastor Luke and the great team that's here. They just, this is such a wonderful church. Hey, put your hand right on your heart. Let's pray before we get started. Father, thank you so much for, uh, we just, we just want to, we don't want to just tick off a box that we came to church this week. No, God, we want, we want an encounter with you. We want an encounter with you. We don't, we don't want to be the same people that we walked in today. We, we want to be different when we walk out. God, we, our hearts are open. God, we, we ask you to remove any distractions, anything that may be clouding our mind. And Father, we want to hear your spirit. We want to hear your word in our ear. We want to hear that still, small voice, God, that, that you love us. And we know you do, but sometimes we just need you to tell us. God, we thank you that today is a shame-off kind of day. God, that shame will be removed. Guilt will be removed. And Father, we'll step into the promise that you have for us. And God, we love you that our hearts will be full, God, for a week that we have. And we can come back next week and, and just get more. There's something special when we gather together. God, we don't take it for granted. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody shout it. Amen. Before you sit down, look at three people. Say, you look, you look like you need a little church today. Come on, look at them. You look like you need a little church today. Well, hey, I want to get right down to business because I don't have a lot of time. I want you to get a note, something to take some notes with, maybe your phone, your iPad, right on your neighbor's arm, whatever you need to do. Get a pen out. I want to teach you just a little bit. And I have a question that I want to start with you today. I just, I just have a, real, just a simple question that I want you to think about not just in the framework of today, but I want you to think about it in the framework of your life, of your marriage, of your family, of your business of your city, of your neighborhood. I want you to think, I just want you to answer this question. Do you believe that God has something better for you? I mean, do you really believe it? I know, I know. Hey, listen, listen, listen. I, I know it's easy to say it in church. It's really easy. Everybody's nice looking. They took a shower today. They smell good. I mean, Dream City smells better than any church I've ever been to in my entire life. I mean, you guys smell nice. It's easy in this environment. I'm talking about, do you really believe it? Because tomorrow you're going to go back to that job, that that boss that you have that you don't like. But thankful you got a job. Come on. You're going to go out to the parking lot and you're going to get in that car that's held together by Jesus bumper stickers. You're going to go home and you're going to walk right into the house and, and he's going to be sitting on the couch. You wanted him to come to church, but he's going to be sitting on the couch and he's going to ask you about church and do you really believe that God has something better for you? I mean, really better. See, I believe that your best days are ahead of you. Come on, do you believe that? 
I love Philippians chapter 1. Paul says this in verse 6. He's telling the Philippian church. Look, look at what he says. He says, being confident. Everybody shout confident. Confident. Not egotistical, but confident. That word confident is the Greek word patho, and it means to be fully persuaded, fully convinced. Paul's the same. I am fully and completely persuaded and convinced of this very thing, that God who has begun a good work in me will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Meaning that there are going to be times where it just doesn't seem like things are good, but we got to believe things are going to get better. Better, better, better days, best days, good days, gooder days, as they say in North Carolina. When I was, uh, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and my wife and I in 2002 moved uh, with our three kids uh, to Charlotte, North Carolina to plant our church. I'm an only child. Don't, ha don't be hating on the only child. I'm an only grandchild, which means two things. I'm spoiled rotten and don't eat my food. You know what I'm talking about. If you're an only child, don't be reaching over. My, my wife would reach over and try to grab some french fries. I'm like, don't touch my food. This is my food. It's like, you know, I'm in prison. Just, you know, cover it up. I'd say, if she would go to the restaurant, she'd reach over and grab my french fries. Look, if you want french fries, sweetheart, I'll buy you some french fries. But why do you have to eat my? Well, yours tastes better. What does it matter? I mean, just these are my fries. And so, so I grew up. That has nothing to do with the message, but just thought you'd enjoy that. So I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and I was about 11 or 12 years old. And this was back in the day where... Um, our, our, our moms and dads would send us outside to play, that place out beyond. You know what I'm talking about. We don't send our kids out anymore because they, don't, they might get kidnapped. They might, my, my, I don't know, my mom didn't really care. This was back in the day when they would send you out about 9 o'clock in the morning and tell you not to come home till dark. No cell phones, no helmets, no seat belts. She's like, if you die, I'll just make another one just like you. Right? I guess that's what she thought. I wouldn't come home until night. I and mean, you had to be home right at dark or you get in big trouble. But we'd be gone all day long. No way to get in touch. So all my friends, Kenny, Doug, Eddie, my posse, we would go to this place called Staples Mill Pond. And we would hang out around the Staples Mill Pond. It was our hangout. It was our place. It was our club. The Staples Mill Pond would freeze. We'd ice skate on it. We'd ride our bikes on it, ride our skateboards on it. We would do anything we could on Staples Mill Pond. And there was a place that Staples Mill Pond, kind of just like this stage, it would pour over, and there was about a 20-foot drop, and there was a shelf where we would go down and where these two roads came together, and there was a huge, big sewer pipe that you could actually go into. It was incredible, man. Who cares what it smelled like? It was awesome. But there was one area where the water came down, and there was an area of about a 10-foot ledge that led over a 10-foot ten ten leap of a new area over here that nobody had ever gone to because there was this gap of 10 feet that you had to jump, and about 25 feet down. So if you fell, you'd die. I mean, you would either break some bones. It was jagged, no water down there. It was terrible. And so 11 or 12 years old, you're looking at that like that's a million-mile jump. But I knew I would go down there every, it, for some reason, every time I would go into that club, I would look over at that area, and i go, nobody's ever explored that area. It looks extremely cool. There's a little tree coming out. There's a cave in there. But nobody had ever gone over there until one day. And I was that kid that always wanted to go first. Bet you can't jump that. I'm the one that's going to try it. Bet you can't do that. I'm the one that's going to try it. I'm going to do everything first. And so my friends were playing, and nobody ever dared anybody to do it because it was very dangerous, like really dangerous. And so, so here I am. I'm, I'm practicing. Like I'm, I'm trying to think, all right, if I hit this just right, I can leap, and I can land on the other side, and I can do something that nobody has ever done before. I can explore this area that nobody's ever explored before. And so I, they were playing, and so I'm just practicing my jump, because I had to hit it just right. And so I ran, and I jumped. And you know how it feels like? You ever been in a situation where it seems like it goes in slow-mo? You know, and I'm flying through the air. It was a good ending, probably. I landed on the other side, almost fell, but I made it. It was awesome. And I got to explore, and I had no idea how I was going to get back. But I got to explore this better area. What I want to do is I want to talk to you about what it takes to go from here 
to there. I want to talk to you about that gap, that, that chasm that sometimes we've got to jump over in order to get the better that God has for you. That's why I started with the question. If, see, if you believe it, then you're actually willing to take the risk, take the chance, do what's necessary, maybe get a little dirty, maybe, maybe even challenge the status quo in order to get to the place that nobody's ever gone before. Maybe to be the first person to ever go to college in your family. Maybe be, be the first person to ever start a business and it be successful. Maybe be the first person that you won't have any divorce in your legacy. Maybe, maybe, maybe that is what is better for you. And we're going to use it in the context of the Jordan River. The title of this message is Crossing Jordan. Now here's what I believe. Look at me. I believe every single person in this room is either facing or will face a Jordan River in their life. And I'm going to explain to you what it means. Now, you may know the story, and we're going to use the story of God's chosen people, the Israelites. Moses, you know, Charlton Heston says, hey, listen, let's get everybody out. Old school movie. You've probably seen the movie. And so he says, hey, let's get everybody out of Egypt. 400 years they've been locked in captivity and slavery. They, they've been oppressed. They've built all the temples, everything that the Pharaoh's asked them. 400 years they've been there. And so Moses is sent by God to deliver them out of Egypt into this promised land, this better area, this, this good that God has planned for them. Actually, that promise had been delivered to Abraham many, many, many years back before that. And God had still had this place for you. And here's what I want you to hear today, church, that no matter what dream God has given you, it is not dead. It is not dead. There is a better life for you. And so, so, so Moses delivers them out. They get out into the wilderness. And you know the story. An 11-day journey turns into a 40-year trip. Come on, like, I mean, that is a trip from hell. Can you imagine? 11 days. So why, why in the world did it take 40 years? Because here's the thing, and, and this is what we face in our own life. Oftentimes we wonder, why am I walking and wandering around in this wilderness? It's because oftentimes what happens when it comes to the wilderness we're facing God's got to get out of us what Egypt has put into us. So your wilderness, my wilderness, the time frame is all dependent not on God, but on us. Are we willing to let go of the Egypt that we have? That we carry right in, so 11 days. So you can either have an 11 day journey or a 40 year journey, it's up to you. Not up to God, it's up to us. And so Moses ends up passing away, and Joshua takes over as the captain. And God tells him, listen, you can do it, Joshua. Be strong, good courage. Be strong, good courage. Be strong and good courage. So now we catch up with the Israelites in Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, and they're on the edge of the Jordan River. Then Joshua, verse 1, rose early in the morning, got up early, did his exercise, had his green juice, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan. Everybody say the Jordan. Look at your neighbor, say the Jordan. Look at your other neighbor, say I knew a guy named Jordan. <laughs> he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. Okay, let's talk about the Jordan River for a second because when we read the scriptures, the Bible's so interesting, guys. I, I, would, I hope that you would read it one day. It is one of the most amazing books on the planet. It kind of goes, just so you know, it kind of goes along with being a Christian. Just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> Incredible book. And most, a, a lot of times what happens is there are geographic location names that actually mean something within the context more than just the fact that it's a place. And the Jordan River happens to be one of those places all through the scriptures. You may not know this, but it happens over 200 different times the Jordan River is mentioned in the Bible. And it always is that gap or that boundary that separates people from where they are and the better that God has for them. Every single time. Every time it's mentioned, it represents that gap that we have to jump. That thing that we have to get over in order to get the better. Go from better to best, from good to good, or whatever it may be. That, that jump that we need to take. Not, not a necessarily long river. It's only about 200 20 miles long, not necessarily wide. It's only about 100 feet wide at its widest point, not really deep. 
not really significant in the sense of geographically, but sometimes when it comes to us, it seems like it's just an eternity before we can get to the better that God has for it. But if you believe it, you're willing to do something about it. Now, here's what we know about the Israelites. Here's what we know, guys. The Israelites faced two bodies of water in order to get to the promised land. And we hear a lot of talk about the Red Sea, don't we? A lot of talk about the Red Sea. So what's the difference between the Red Sea and the Jordan River? See, the Red Sea represents a going out of. The Jordan River represents a going into. The Red Sea is a letting go of. The Jordan River is a grabbing hold of. Now, here's what happens as believers. The Red Sea represents that one time that you come out. Notice that the Israelites didn't cross. Or another way to look at it, it, the Red Sea only shows up about 20 times in the Scripture. And the Israelites didn't have to pass over the Red Sea more than once. So the thing is, is that when it comes to our walk with God, the, rep- the Red Sea represents that thing that we, ju- we got to get through one time. But Christians spend their entire lives around the Red Sea because they never realize that God has something better for them. So they end up spending all of their life just trying to stay saved. And there's so much more than just getting your sins forgiven. Are you following what I'm talking about? Now, now listen, listen. Sometimes we need that. But the Bible tells me that once I confess my sin, the Bible, God doesn't remember it anymore. Unless I bring it up to him again. I just wanted to remind you last week, God, you know, I I told somebody they were number one on the highway. You'll get that later when you're going to lunch, all right? See, the Christian life is so much more than just keeping our salvation. My desire as a pastor is for people not just to keep camping around the Red Sea, but eventually cross their Jordan into the inheritance. The Red Sea is about deliverance. The Jordan is about inheritance. So let me give you a couple thoughts if you want to write these down about the Jordan. The Jordan symbolizes a boundary, a boundary. It's a separator. It's a dividing line. It's a barrier. Sometimes it's meant to separate you from mediocrity, average, the status quo. A lot of times it's meant to separate you from the people who don't want you to have a better life. You may not know this, but not everybody wants you to lose 15 pounds. They like you a little chubby because it makes them feel okay about their chubbiness. And you start losing weight, puts a little pressure on them. They're like, why are you getting so skinny, trying to be all cool, you know, selfie. Getting all skinny and going to work out. And, and what you're doing, what happened? I call it a new normal. Whenever we create a new normal, we leave normal behind. And sometimes it's those people that want to keep us back. They hold us back. You going to go to college? Yeah. <laughs> we heard about those college people being all snooty and everything. You don't need to go to college. You can just get a job like I did. They want to hold you back. Come on, sometimes you're going to have to leave. And here's the thing about a boundary. The Jordan River represents that place. Sometimes you're going to have to leave some people on the other side. you got to be willing to do that. I know it's not easy, but they need me. No, they don't. They don't need you. They actually need you to leave. You're addicted to enabling them, and you need to let them go. Hello. Let me, pre- let me, let me amen myself real quick. That's good preaching right there, white boy. Everybody say the Jordan. The David used it as his protection from Absalom, his son, who was trying to take over the kingdom. David crossed over the Jordan River. Second thing, if you want to write this down, is the Jordan represents transition. Transition from old to new. It represents a new season that we go into. One of my favorite stories is the story of Elijah and Elisha. I love Elijah, man. He was a stud. I mean, he, he, he whooped 850 prophets, he ran faster than Pharaoh's chariots. I mean, Usain Bolt ain't got nothing on Elijah. And he had this guy who was following around, a guy by the name of Elisha, who was wanting what Elijah had. And so he stuck to Elijah. There's a story in 2 Kings where Elijah is, everybody knows, everybody that's with Elijah knows that he's about to go to heaven. He's about to die, and Elisha knows it too, but he wants something from Elijah. Watch this. This is really cool. 
And so Elijah says to Elisha, he says, hey, listen, I'm going to go over to Bethel. Why don't you stay right here? Why don't you stay right here? And Elisha says, no, 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 I'm going to go with you because I want something from you. And so Elijah goes over to Bethel. He gets to Bethel and he tells Elisha, he says, hey, Elisha, I, I, I'm going to go over to Jericho. Why don't you stay right here? And I love Elisha's response because he wanted something from him. He knew that he, there was something better, come on, better for his life. And he says, as my soul lives, as your soul lives, I'm going to stick with you until the day you die. I'm, I'm going to be with you. And Elijah says, okay, okay. So he says, once he gets to Jericho, he says, hey, I'm going to go to the Jordan. I'm going to cross over the Jordan River. So there it is, the Jordan. Now watch what happens. Elijah says, I'm going to go over to the Jordan. Why don't you stay right here? Elijah says, no, 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 Elijah. I've already told you, man. I'm, I'm with you. Now here's what happens. As soon as Elijah crosses over the Jordan River, he turns to Elisha and he says, ask what you want from me. Now here's what I think is so interesting, church, is that it wasn't until he passed three individual tests of obedience that Elijah actually asked him the question of what he wanted. We often want God to ask us what we want way before we're tested in our obedience. We want it early, don't we? We want it quick right now before we've been to Bethel, before we've been to Jericho, before we crossed over the Jordan. So he turns to Elisha and he says, what do you want from me? And I love Elisha's response. I mean, he's bold. He says, I want a double portion, baby. I want two times what you got, brother. Two times what you got. That's bold. See, when you believe that God has something better for you, you will get bold in your prayers. You'll get bold in your action. You'll get bold in your faith, man. You'll, you'll go, I can jump that gap. I can do whatever is necessary. You'll pray some crazy, risky prayers. Come on, won't you? Crazy stuff. People are like, what are you saying? I want a double portion. And so check this out. This is awesome. This will make a great Super Bowl commercial. So Elijah, all of a sudden, as soon as he asked that, he said, this is going to be a hard thing, really hard. The sky opens up, and Clydesdales, it's like a Budweiser commercial, except without the beer. Chariot of fire comes out of heaven. Wouldn't this be an amazing way to go to heaven? Imagine, just imagine, just close your eyes for a second, imagine. Imagine you're in your backyard, you got your whole family that's not saved. Uncle Joe who cusses, I mean, he's, he's always talking about politics, I mean, it's terrible. And all of a sudden, you know today's the day, and all of a sudden, the sky opens up and a chariot of fire comes down. I mean, it's like Uber from heaven. <laughs> and picks you up. Do you think Uncle Joe will get saved? Absolutely. And so he picks up Elijah, because Elijah told Elisha, listen, if you see me leave, then you can get that double portion. So watch this. He goes up into heaven. He drops that mantle, which represented his anointing. Elisha picks it up. First thing he did. You know the first thing he did? He went right to the Jordan River. And he slapped the Jordan River and he crossed over. The Jordan River is, it represents transition. Often it represents a transition from the old you to the new you. From unassigned to assigned. From from. From one anointing to another anointing. From, a, from one ministry to another ministry. And so, so I love what happened. Jacob, Jacob is running from his brother. His name means deceiver. And he gets in a wrestling match with God. Beside the Jordan River. He's right on the Jordan River and he's wrestling with God. And you know the story. He, God's like, it's, it's about to... Break day, and I need to go. And Jacob says, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And God says back to him, what's your name? And he says, deceiver. And he goes, you'll no longer be a deceiver. You're going to be the prince of God. Your name will be Israel. See, it's at the Jordan River where we get the new you. You become the, the person that God has created you to be. John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan River. And God told him. He had no idea that the Jordan's all the way through the Bible. He's baptizing people and just dunking them, man, dunking them. And Jesus shows up. God had told him, the guy who shows up and you see the Spirit of God descending upon him and remaining, Jesus became the prototype for us. 
to no longer have the Holy Spirit come upon us, but to live inside of us. So he says, the, the person you see, that's the Messiah. So he, he dunks him, and he comes up out of the water, and the Bible says that out of heaven came a voice, and it says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The thing I love about this is Jesus had not done one thing. He had not preached. He had not prayed for the sick. Didn't walk on the water, didn't raise anybody from the dead, no blinded eyes, no deaf ears open. But God was still pleased in who he was. Jesus at that moment went from being a carpenter's son to being God's son in the Jordan River. <laughs> Write this down too, about the Jordan. The Jordan takes faith. Anything worth having takes faith. I know it looks impossible. At this particular time, the Jordan was flood, flood stage. Raging waters. And that's often what it looks like. It's not going to be easy. Anything worth having is not easy to have. That's the way my ministry's been ever since I started, 17 years ago. We met in a school for, for nine years. We were set up in breakdown. Nine years. Putting stuff in a truck, unloading the truck. Putting it in a storage, unloading the storage. Putting it in a truck. I mean, nine years we were mobile. It's always been a challenge. Every time you face a Jordan, it's going to be a challenge. Every time you step out in faith, it's going to be a challenge. But that, that's, that's how God develops our faith, is the challenge. Be careful when you start asking God to develop your faith, grow your faith. Because the minute that you ask God to grow your faith, you're going to face resistance. That's what happens every single time. Grow my faith. I need more faith. Be careful. Because God's going to throw a giant right in your way. I mean, that's what happened to the Israelites. He, he let them know. Joshua knew they were going to face. When they crossed over the Jordan, they were going to face. Jericho was right there, biggest walls ever. They had the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites. They had the Pepsi lights and the diet rights. I mean, all the ites were there. My wife loves it when I say that. So how do you do it? If it takes faith, then how do you do it? Well, Joshua tells us, look at verse 2 of Joshua chapter 3. I'm almost done. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp. And they commanded the people. This is what Joshua told the officers to say. When you see the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure, about 3,000 feet. Don't come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go. And I love what he says right here. He says, for you have not passed this way before. We can never get new things with old ways. You, you can never, you never, you'll never cross the Jordan by thinking the way you did before. It always takes a new mindset. And isn't it interesting? I don't know, I don't know if this happens to you, Pastor Luke, but oftentimes God shifts my mindset way before the miracle happens. I'm believing for the miracle, and he shifts my mindset, just an ever so slightly. And sometimes, listen to me, sometimes the shift in mindset, here's how it works. It's just simply God changing our perspective on the problem. And the way he does it is he moves us a little bit away from it so we can see it from a different perspective. And so he shows us from all different sides. We don't like this because we want him to deal with the problem. But this is how he teaches us on recognizing him in the midst of the problem, by changing our mindset. And so Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. Notice he didn't say that God was going to sanctify them. And this sanctification had nothing to do with salvation because they had already been circumcised. In chapter 2 is when he circumcised them. So this was a different type of cleansing. For tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I don't know if you saw it, but he gave two directives really quickly. The first directive that he tells the people of Israel, he says, number one, follow God. Everybody say, follow God. follow God. When you see the covenant chest, the Ark of the Covenant, your God carried by the Levitical priest, start moving, follow it. Notice he didn't say follow trends. He said follow God. Church, we got to be real careful that we don't follow trends. We don't just follow the hot thing that's happening right now. That's what I love about Dream City Church. That's what I love about the heritage of this church. You are sitting 
in a congregation that is built upon years and years of not following trends, not getting distracted and going other directions, but is solid and founded on the word of the living God, constantly following the Holy Spirit. You should thank God for that. Isn't that fantastic? You don't have a pastor that's going just trying to figure out where he's going and over here following this over here and then doing this over here. No, he has a vision from God. To, to accomplish that, that no one's going to perish, that, that every person in Phoenix is going to come to know Jesus Christ. That's what I love. you got to follow God. How do we follow God? What's the best way? Well, there are three things that are in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark was the presence of God. It was where the fire came out of for the children of Israel at night. It was, it was, it was where the priests went, that they connected with God. It was basically the presence of God. That they followed. There were three things inside the covenant that kind of help us understand how to follow them. The first thing that was in there was a pot of manna. Now let me explain to you what manna is. Manna are chicken minis from Chick-fil-A. Buttery, chickeny, goodness. Israelites came out of Egypt and they were angry with God. We're so thirsty. Gives them some water. We're so hungry. And this is how we know they were chicken minis. I'm telling you, they were chicken minis. Because he told him, God told the children of Israel, listen, six days I'm going to pour out chicken minis from heaven. Every day you're going to go out. And you're going to pick up the chicken minis. You're going to put them in a bag. You're going to take them home. Now you know what they did? They tried to put, they got a lot of chicken minis. They put them under the bed. They put them in the pantry, put them in the refrigerator. And, you know, they woke up the next day. And what happened? Worms. Nasty. Because God wanted them, and here, here's the thing. Following God is trusting him every day. Every day. And we knew they were chicken minis because he was open six days and he was closed one day a week. Some of you are thinking about chicken minis right now, but here's the truth. You can't go to Chick-fil-A today. They're not open. So you should have got a bunch yesterday. Put them under. That's what God did. One day a week. He said, store up enough for an extra day. You should have got more. This message would not work anywhere else. My new favorite verse, Matthew 6, 34. Look, look at this verse in the message paraphrase. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't we get so focused on what's going to happen tomorrow? Don't we get so focused? Well, what's going to, some of you, you, you didn't sleep the last three nights because you're so concerned about a meeting you're having on Wednesday. He says, don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. Look at, look at this last part. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Isn't that good to know? God's got you. Trust him every day. Second thing, second thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant was Aaron's rod that budded. The Israelites got real angry. You know, they're like, why is Aaron the leader? Shouldn't we have somebody else? Why did you pick him? And so, they, so Moses... Under the direction of God says, all right, well, why don't you all, all of you guys, 12 tribes, why don't you all bring a rod and we'll see what God does with it. So they take the rods before the presence of God. They sleep on it, wake up the next day. And one rod had budded, bloomed, and produced almonds on it. It was Aaron's rod. And here's the thing. Following God is knowing that you are chosen. You're chosen. You've been picked. God picked you. You are his masterpiece. You are his, in the Greek, poema. There's nobody else like you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are picked first. I like to way, look at it this way. I am God's favorite. I am. I can confidently say that I am. Troy Maxwell is God's favorite. But you know what Pastor Tommy Barnett can say? The same exact thing. He is God's favorite too. That's what makes God so wonderful, seven billion of us, and he's got his eye on each one of us all the time because you are chosen. Come on. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 4 says, long before, this is what I love about God, long before he laid down earth's foundation, before he set this third rock in a spin, you were on his mind. Settled on us as the focus of his love. He could have loved anything, but he chose you to love. And listen, look at me, look at me, let me. 
he still loves you. He'll never stop loving you. No matter what you've done, you are not a failure, although you have failed. We've all failed. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But he still loves you, and he picked you. And you're still, you're, you're never, you'll never be picked second or third or fourth. You're always God's first pick. The third thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments. Because following God is obedience to the word. We have to be obedient, church. And sadly in the American church, not this church, but sadly in the American church, we have far out-educated, far out-educated our doing, our obedience. We know way more. And, and what could happen today? What could happen? What could happen today is you could, you could just right now, you could decide, oh, you know what? Huh. I give that message maybe a, a six out of ten. Maybe six and a half because he's cute. I get a half a point just for being cute. I'll take it. You can go home. You can go home. Look, you can go home, Google any church in America, in the world, and watch 25 podcasts. But can I just challenge you? How about, how about we do something that we learned today? You know, look, I'm all about saying amen. That's good. Go, pastor. But how about... What, God, what can you change in me today? What if every Sunday, you know, there's only 52 Sundays out of the year. What if, what if every Sunday we came with the intention of taking something that Pastor Luke said? Just one thing, not all three of his points. All three of his points are amazing. But what if we took one and said, I want to apply that to my life, to my marriage, to my family. Just one thing every week. And we said, I'm going to try to do this in my life. That's what following God is. And then the second thing, and then I'm done, is Joshua says, clean yourself up. He says in verse 5 of Joshua chapter 3, Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourself. Sanctify. That's a, that's a fancy word that just simply means separate yourself. It, mean, it means to pull yourself away. I like the definition of, of remove from common use. We live in a world that is, especially in our country, that is a lot of division. A lot of things as Christians that we can tweet about, we can Instagram about. A lot of things we can be angry about. A lot of the votes that are happening. But can I just be honest with you? Something that I feel like is in my heart. I really feel like that we can't legislate morality. So... It, Honestly, I don't think it's about having the right person in office. I don't think it's about having the right vote. I think it's about having a personal revival in our own heart where we say, I want to be different than the world. And I think that's what it's going to take in our generation. I'm passionate about this. I, I think we need, to, we need to separate ourselves. We can't be like everybody else. We have to not worry about whether they're going to tolerate our talking about Jesus and standing up for what is right. Not, not bashing people. Look, it's not about winning an argument. It's about winning the person. And the greatest way that you can win a person is for people to say, I may not believe what you believe, but man, I want to be like you. I want, I want, I want the marriage that you have. I want the kids that you have. I want the relationship. There's something different about you. That is what Joshua was talking about. So why don't you stand with me today. And I want to invite you to do something. We're going to go old school today, if we can, in these last couple minutes that I have. Just, just I want to challenge you. Are you facing your Jordan today? Are you tired of wandering around in the wilderness? Maybe... Maybe today is the day where you decide that you're going to leave the past behind. I know there's some people in here, maybe even watching online, and here's the thing. You've been considering Jesus. You've been coming for a little while. You're probably sitting around the back so you can leave real quick so nobody will talk to you, get you involved in somewhere. You don't want to, you don't want to talk to anybody because, hey, listen, we've all been there. Maybe you even got hurt in church. 
another church in the city, you got hurt. You know, I don't want to get, now you're going to ask me to serve, and I don't really want to serve because, you know, that leader did this and that. Listen, 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 listen. God has a plan for your life. And today could be the day where you take that leap of faith. I can promise you there's no perfect church. Dream City is a great church, but it's not perfect because we're here. So if you're looking for that perfect church, I, <laughs> you're not going to ever find it. This is close, but you'll never find it. But we serve a perfect God. And I just sense his presence right now. That he wants to touch your life and encourage you and maybe give you that little push to take that leap of faith. I want to thank you for watching this message today. I believe that right now as you're watching this video, God is speaking to your heart. God is speaking to you about a new life, a new future, a new hope. The Bible says that the way we connect with God is we actually call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's almost like taking your cell phone out and making a call to somebody that you really love. You're making the call. And I wanna encourage you to make the call to God today. And as you do, he promises to forgive your sins, to adopt you into his family, and to give you a hope and a future. So today, if you are ready to call upon the name of the Lord, would you just close your eyes right now and just sincerely say these words to God. Dear Heavenly Father, just say those words. I ask you today to be the leader of my life, I ask you to forgive me for my sins and adopt me into your family. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. So I give you my heart today. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, he heard you and he forgave you. So I want to say to you, welcome to the family of God. Go find a great church to be involved in. If you don't have one, come join us here at Dream City, and we'll help you live out the Christian faith and grow closer to Jesus. God bless you all.